Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. This is part one of my interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson, which might be the best interview I've ever done. I feel like I've learned the entire meaning of life at this point, and it was amazing. You definitely need to listen to both episodes, but you'll see I just couldn't stop asking him questions and all that. This is part one. Stay tuned for part two, and I hope you enjoy I literally read this whole transcript out loud to Kyle before the episode came out because it's just that life-changing. So enjoy part one and stay tuned after this for part two. Neil deGrasse Tyson is the author of Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist and the author of the number one best-selling Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, among other books. He is the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History, where he has served since 1996. Dr. Tyson is also the host and co-founder of the Emmy-nominated popular podcast Star Talk and its spinoff Star Talk Sports Edition, which combines science, humor, and pop culture. He is a recipient of 21 honorary doctorates, the Public Welfare Medal from the National Academy of Sciences, and the Distinguished Public Service Medal from NASA. Asteroid 13123, Tyson, is named in his honor. He lives in New York City, and we were very lucky to have done this interview in person. Welcome, Dr. Tyson, a.k.a. Neil, if I feel comfortable enough. (laughs) (laughs) Please call me Neil. Thank you for coming Mm -hmm. on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Starry Messenger, Cosmic Perspectives on Civilization. Mm. By the way, I don't think anybody has time to read books, not just moms. I know. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm delighted about the concept. That you will. I also would. I'm looking for someone at some point to host. Dads don't have time to read books. Oh, okay. <laughs> what I wonder is, do publishers like what you're doing? Because if you don't have time to read the book, they'll just listen to the podcast and then they never have to buy the book. They do buy yeah. the book, though. Oh, they do. <laughs> because once all of the authors come on, they get to know the authors, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, that does sound really good," or "I really oh, love okay. that guy." All right. So I that's promise. The, the other side of that it, coin. It's, okay. it's big. I did originally try to sell a book. Club Mom said I have time to read books, and nobody found that funny. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I could try it now, and it All might right. go over better. Mm-hmm. Okay, tell everyone about your book. What is this about? Why did you write this now? You're so accomplished. Why Why do this? Well, forgive me for making mom references, you, but you this book was gestating within me. <laughs> nice. <Are we laughs> Please forgive this me. The whole time? Do forgive me. <laughs> I okay. can do this, too. <laughs> okay. It, it was actually gestating within me. My entire scientific life. I was an early science thinking kid from middle school, even a little earlier, just coming out of elementary school. And that's when I knew I wanted to study the universe and be an astrophysicist. So I had a, I had a response as early as age 11 to that annoying question that adults always ask kids, which is, what do you want to be when you What do you up? want to be when you grow up? And I would say astrophysicist. And, you know, normally you say, I'll be a, you know, engineer or lawyer. Oh, Aunt Betty is a lawyer. Uh, Uncle Joe is a doctor. But no one knew any astrophysicists. So that was a, those are pretty short conversations. I think you're my first astrophysicist. Okay, that'd be, that's not un, unlikely because there aren't many of us in the world. There's about, actually, numerically, there's, you know, maybe eight to 10,000 astrophysicists in the world. And we're passing through eight billion people. And so if you do the math, that's one in a million. So if you're in the same room with an astrophysicist ever at all, that's your chance to ask all the questions because you never know when that occasion will ever repeat. But early on, even as a kid, I just look around and I'd say, 
I, I see full grown people saying things and doing things that made no sense. It's like, what do you do? Don't you know how the earth works or how the sun? Don't, have you thought about the statistics of this or the probability of this? Don't you know? And then I'd get older and it got worse and worse. You know, I'd visit Las Vegas. There are people at the roulette table. There hasn't been a seven in a while. It's due. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> and then I said, well, how come nobody knows this? And there's a big part of it is just, we're not taught probability and statistics. It's offered maybe as an elective, maybe, but so much of our lives are guided by what we think is true, what we want to be true, what we desire to be true. You buy a lottery ticket expecting to win, okay? Expecting to win. You know, there's only one, I think, legitimate reason for buying a lottery ticket. But who am I to judge other people's motives? So let me pull, let me take a half step back from that and say, you know you're not likely going to win. You understand this. Okay. So maybe they do understand it. But then there's the hope. Okay. So I met someone who each week she would go through the, those brochures of real estate, mm -hmm. beautiful homes yes. on beaches, and who, nobody does. Those. We I love you. You, you got to love them. Gotta you got to love those. Yeah. And she said, she buys one lottery ticket each week, and as she looks through the brochure, she imagines what home she would buy mm. if she won the lottery. And so this brings her some psychological, um, not so much comfort, but joy. Okay. Just thinking about that. So I couldn't, I can't take that away from her. I'm fine. We'll go with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But if you start taking a third of your paycheck and putting it in lottery tickets, it's like, no. All right. But that's just the probability and statistics side of it. Once I gathered all of this throughout my life, then I became, it was gestating, and then I became like fully pregnant with it. Again, forgive the uterine analogies here, but that's exactly what it felt like. And there I was, sort of pregnant with this book. I said, okay, it's got to come out. It's time when it's got to come out. It's got to come out. And the, the entire book, just came out of me, written. I've been asked the question, when in writing the book, what did you do when you had writer's block or when you stumbled? No. <laughs> no. The whole book came out. And yeah, I would I would make fine-tuning edits after, but the whole book came out all at once. And it's what civilization looks like when you're scientifically literate, especially when you have a cosmic perspective on it. So it, it breaks out into chapters rather naturally. So, uh, but they're subjects that we've all thought about and fought over, especially during Thanksgiving dinner, where people think they're saying the right thing and it's authentic and it's justified. Uh, well, have you thought about it this other way? Have you seen your arguments and what they look like if you knew this other thing that's true? Often, people are arguing when they're arguing over nothing but they don't know it. They're arguing what they believe is real rather than on what is real. So there are chapters in there. There's one on truth and beauty. There's one on risk and reward. That's the one where we talk about probability. There's one on, oh, here's one, uh, meat eaters and vegetarians. They're always fighting with each yeah. other. I said, let me just jump in there, have a few <laughs> things to say, and then get out. All right, I'll go in the octagon, you know, see if I can say some things to the warring parties, and then, and I'll give examples if you're interested in a moment, but I'm just giving yeah. sort of the overview here. And there's a chapter on, on gender and identity, mm -hmm. what that looks like when you're scientifically literate, color and race, yeah, I went there, yeah, and uh, truth and beauty, truth and beauty, and did I say truth and beauty yet? Yeah, I did, yeah. and on uh, life and death. Another one, body and mind. Mm. So these are topics you don't think of as astrophysics topics, but you may be interested to know what they look like if you are an astrophysicist. <laughs> okay? And that's what this book is. It's a portal. It's a portal of understanding. So what would an astrophysicist, like you say, about death? What was your, what's the like party line? What so should we know about? It's life and death. It's life and death is, yep. the, is the chapter. And... 
Yeah. Well, I don't know why I have to jump to the most. You can jump. Crazy. That's the final chapter, too. Yeah. Life and death. You, yeah. can't, you can't begin with that. You got to Okay, okay. You got No, no, but I can, I'll, I'll go there I now. I warm you up. No, 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 no. Let's I'm, go. You, I'm, you, this is your show. We, I'm interested. This is your show. I'm, you ready? Yes. Are you seated? I'm ready. Okay. So, if you look at the human genome and look at how many possible humans, unique humans, can be created mm -hmm. from the genome. Mm -hmm. It's staggeringly large. I put in there one with 30 zeros, but it's even bigger than that. Okay, there's a calculation where you get 30 zeros, but most attempts to calculate this number are much larger than that. Now, how many humans have ever been born? We know that number, it's about 100 billion. So 100 billion is a staggeringly small fraction of the total humans who could ever be born. So, for people out there, no matter your struggles, no matter your illnesses, no matter what hand the genetic lotto delivered to you, you are alive against all odds. And this is a point made, really brought home by Richard Dawkins, but I, I had to take it to another sort of cosmic notch where you, you will die one day, and that death will conclude your life. And so, unless you're of some religions who are certain, most religions are certain of everything the religion says. This is an interesting other fact. And you compare all the religions in the world and they don't really say the same thing yeah. about what is true. So that's, that's an awkward situation if you wanna be religious in multiple ways. You mm. can't really, you have to sort of pick one and just ascribe to that. But you're a few years on Earth are precious for that reason. Because most people who could ever exist will never even be born. So your existence, no matter the state of your existence, you're among the lucky ones. Extraordinarily lucky. Now, the people say, I wanna live forever. Really, have you thought that through? <laughs> Holding aside that if everyone lived forever, we actually have to stop the birth rate or find another planet to move to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that we, there are issues there. But let's assume that's resolved in whatever way. Consider that if you live forever, then you always have tomorrow. Mm. So then what is your motivation for doing anything today? I assert that there's nothing more motivating to what you can and should do in life than the knowledge, the certain knowledge that you're gonna die one day. Mm -hmm. And you and people think of death as a morbid subject, but let's look at a couple of examples. If your loved one brought you flowers and they were plastic, what would you think? You say they're not. I think go back to the <laughs> go back to the store. <laughs> but but wait a minute. But wait, the the plastic flowers will last forever. They won't die. But deep down, you know that you value the flowers not only because they're beautiful, but also because they die. Mm -hmm. And so you value that they're early before they open up and then they do open and then they have a fragrance. Yes, you have to care for them. You have to change the water and, and snip the, the, the stems. And so they're not carefree, but you will hold them and watch them through their, if I can use this word for flowers, senescence, mm -hmm. okay, where they start turning and then they die. They have ran the natural course of their lives after having been cut. And that fact makes you appreciate them all the more. So in a sense then, it is death itself that gives meaning to life. Hmm. Think of if you've owned a dog, it might be true for cats, I just know less about cats, but if you have dogs, you know, you are the hero in the dog's life. <laughs> you come home from getting the mail and the dog is jumping all over you and licking you in the face, okay? The dog is excited to just be around you. To, to No matter the time of day, they're not saying, I'm too sleepy, come back later. You wanna, let's go out. You know, the leash, the sound of the leash, okay? The dog is on top of that. For how long? Dog might live 12, 13, 14 years. 15 tops. So if you multiply that by seven, 
you get a human age for when we die. Mm -hmm. Hence that famous formula, dog years, mm -hmm. human years. So that got me thinking, maybe a dog knows this. A dog is alive for only one out of seven days that you're alive. You live an entire week. That equals a dog, a day in the life of a dog. Maybe the dog knows this. So the dog makes every day count mm. in ways we might squander days in our weeks and in our months. And so for me, the dog is a reminder of how precious life is because no moment goes by without a dog just celebrating the fact that they're alive and not among those who have never been born. Wow. That's in, that's only part of the life and death chapter. So how does that motivate you? Every day. Now, I was thinking less about death when I was a child. Children don't hardly ever think about death unless they see some scary program. And by the way, children don't so much fear death as much as they fear getting eaten. <laughs> really? No, no, think, think about this. Look at every fairy tale where the life of the child was put at risk. Mm -hmm. The risk was getting eaten <laughs> by the witch or by the bear or by the fox or, or the, the wolves, the big bad wolf, you know, Little Red Riding Hood. It's always getting eaten. And in the early Star Wars films, almost everyone who died, the second film I think it was, second of the ones that were made, they were eaten. They were these creatures that just would eat you. And so kids, I think, fear being eaten. And and what's what's their favorite scary dinosaur? You've had it, kids. What's the favorite dinosaur? T Rex. T Rex, of course. Okay. I'm like, I'm okay. like, don't don't let me. I'm, I'm totally here. putting you on the spot <laughs> because I know there's a commonality to this sort of human perspective, and and a T Rex will eat you. So kids respect T Rex all the way. And uh, what's their favorite object in the universe? Black holes. They'll eat you, okay? Mm -hmm. but, but my point is, I, I didn't think of death as a child, but I thought the universe is so vast, and I don't have much time. I mean, how much time? I'm going to live 80 years, perhaps, but um, back then I was thinking maybe only 70, 75, but we've got, all gotten healthier since then, and I'm that old to remember <laughs> when that's, I used to think that way. And there was so much to learn. I didn't want to delay. Mm -hmm. The time I could take to learn about how the universe worked and the math necessary to speak in the language of the universe, to commune with the cosmos, as was my desire and ambition. And then I get older and then I have kids. And for me, the greatest kid wisdom was, especially when they're younger and infants, basically through toddlerhood, while you have to prevent them from killing themselves, so basically zero mm -hmm. through three or four. Mm -hmm. That is, watch at every second. Right. Five, they can run up and down the house, and you know they're not going to do something completely stupid. So if your house is, house is generally childproof. But over those early years, it's like this is never going to end, and you don't get any sleep. And, you're, and you realize the days go by slowly, mm -hmm. but the years go by quickly. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, it's a peculiar concept to embrace, but in terms of one's sense of time and how you use it, I want to make sure that, like, now maybe this is because I'm an academic fundamentally, but no reason why other people couldn't feel this way. If there's a day where you don't learn something, it's, you kind of wasted that day. <laughs> you kind of, a little bit. There's a finite number of days you have left alive. Even though you don't know how many days there are, you know it's finite. Every day, every next sunset, sunrise. I don't want to use this analogy in this case, but it comes to mind. The prisoner in the jail cell, you put an X on the day. Mm -hmm. That's one less day for you. So it's a quote from Horace Mann, the educator. It was around early 1800s, actually. We all know there's a Horace Mann school. and We've heard the name, if, even if you don't know fully about the guy. He was an educator. At a, one point, I think, head of a university. And one of his last speeches to the students, he said, I beseech you to treasure this up in your hearts. Be ashamed to die until you've scored some victory for humanity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a free society, there's no obligation to do that. 
you can just live your own life and not help anyone. But, you know, I grew up in a pretty progressive household, and you're always thinking about the plight of others Mm -hmm. who could benefit from you, your time, your energy, your resources. And so fold it into learn something every day. Why not spend a little bit of your life lessening the suffering of others? And then the whole world is a little better off. Mm -hmm. And another piece of that is I don't ever want anyone to return a favor. Hmm. If I do you a favor, I'll return the favor on it. No, pass it forward. I don't need your favor back. Okay? Just do a favor for someone else. Think about it. When someone returns the favor, it closes off. Mm -hmm. It stops the exchange of goodness Mm -hmm. that could be moving through the world. But if everyone passed it forward, then it spreads in a good way. Yep. It spreads virally in a good way. Yep. And so life and death, when you think of it scientifically, biologically, I think it brings focus to our lives. And on your deathbed, you know, I, I don't want to regret not having learned more, not having loved more, not having cared more. I want to be content and say, my time has come, my life is done. Now you can ask, well, what happens after death? As a, you didn't ask that maybe, or maybe you kind of asked it. What happens after death? Well, I, we know scientifically, okay? You have a certain energy in your body that's accumulated from the consumption of plants and animals throughout your life. If you're vegetarian, then it would be plants and possibly animal products like milk and this sort of thing. But in any event, it inv- no matter whether you're a meat eater or a vegetarian, you killed life forms to survive. Okay? Mm-hmm. Every life form on earth does that except plants because they get their energy from the sun. So everybody else is killing something in order to, okay, we get that. That's the great circle of life. We know the song <laughs> from The Lion King. So... Well, why do we do that? Well, it, there's a calorie content of the food we eat. Calories is the exact word for energy. We use the word calorie, but it is energy. Mm-hmm. Okay? How many calories does it have is the same question as how much energy does it have. Mm-hmm. You consume this. This builds your bone, your muscles and bones and tissues and enables you to move. But most importantly, it maintains your body temperature at 98.6 degrees, 37 degrees Celsius. It maintains that no matter what the temperature is outside. We're in a very comfortable room right now. It's maybe 72 degrees. You're 98 degrees. Why don't you just cool down to the, if you put food in here that's 98 degrees, it'll cool down to 72 degrees and within an hour. Mm -hmm. You You don't cool down. You have a furnace burning within you, a furnace generating that energy so that your whole body can function in an environment that pleases it, which is a 98 degree vessel. So most energy you consume is in the service of maintaining your body temperature. That's why we eat constantly, morning, noon, and night. You know who doesn't eat constantly? Our cold-blooded animals. They don't eat constantly. We like to think they do because when we show crocodiles, they're always ravenously hungry and snakes always trying to take down a thing. But snake eats once a week. Crocodile, depending on how much, once a month. They are the same temperature as their environment. That's what cold blood it is. Mm -hmm. The same temperature. So they don't have to constantly consume energy to maintain their temperature. The point of all of this is the day you die, you no longer have a metabolism. So your body cools. It drops to what temperature? The temperature of its surroundings. At the temperature of its surroundings. It drops to room temperature. Now, if you touch my hand right now, you know what touching another human being feels like. Mm-hmm. You ever touch the hand in the casket? Mm-mm. Oh, you don't, you don't touch bodies and you don't touch dead bodies? I haven't touched you, okay. dead bodies. <laughs> All right. Usually the hand is there because the hands are wrapped across the chest. Yeah. And you touch, uh, try it one day. The first thing people notice, the body's cold. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe the body just came out of the fridge, but usually if it's lying there for viewing, it's been there for at least a day or so. What you're noticing is not that it's cold. It's just not as warm as any body you normally touch. Mm -hmm. It's room temperature. Right. That's what you're noticing. Okay. So, in the act of death, what happens? Well, we know 
let's say you go out through a series of strokes, all right, little strokes that become bigger strokes. You can do neuroscans and you see a part of the brain, brain drops out. That lost oxygen is it's dead, basically. The person doesn't know language anymore. The person doesn't know who you are anymore. The person, the aspects of that person just begin to go away. So everyone who wants to believe that you are something more than what's going on electrochemically in your brain, okay, but it's pretty convincing evidence that your brain is everything that you are. Because as we see the brain disconnect, you start disappearing. Everything we know about you, and it could happen another way. Maybe you can lose your personality, your charm, your, all these pieces of you are happening electrochemically in your brain. And so, on death, scientifically, again, if, if you believe in souls and reincarnation and all this, in a free society, no one is going to take that from you. But if you ask me as a scientist, I can tell you that on death, you and everything we think of as you no longer exists. We know this intuitively when you go into a funeral parlor. You don't say, what room is Freddie in? You don't say, what room is Fred's body? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you've already yep. given up on the idea that someone named Freddie exists. Right. Okay. So you go into a state of non-existence. And you say, well, maybe, you know, do, do I see my ancestors? Do I go to heaven? Or, or, or I guess Jews don't have a hell. But do I go somewhere where there's a, you know, and again, okay. But the evidence looks like you just simply don't exist. Now, is that weird? No, it's not. There's no reason to think that your state of non-existence after death is any different from your state of non-existence before you were born. Before you were born, you weren't saying, where am I? How come I'm not any, where, where? <laughs> You're not having a conversation about not existing because you don't exist yet. So most of the history of civilization, you didn't exist. You exist now for however many years we have left, then you, you enter another state of non-existence. So this is our portal into the reality of this universe. And don't waste a single moment of it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 